as we say, I guess it's been a while since Tennessee was officially home, but it really does feel like coming back home every single time. And I'm really glad to be here and really glad to be able to speak with the family here. If you want to turn to Psalm 136, that's where we're going to be the majority of this lesson. I try to think really hard. I know that Mr. Eric, who's been doing lessons on psalms off and on for as long as I think he's been preaching here. I was trying to think of something. Has he done 136? And I decided that if he had, it's probably been a while, so we were safe on this one. So I hope that's but we're going to get Psalm 136 this morning for the majority of the lesson. And if you look at Psalm 136, it doesn't take long to see what the main point of the psalm is. You are going to see, as we read this, read this psalm, the same phrase for his steadfast love and glory forever repeated 26 times. That's a lot. Especially because there's 26 verses in the whole psalm. So there is one main point that Psalm 136 wants you to get, and that is God's steadfast love endures forever. That's the whole point. I don't know about you guys, but if I'm listening to the radio, there's a song that comes on and that repeats the same two or three lines over and over again. And what I tend to do is I go down and I sing the song. I can't stand song that you say the same thing over and over again. I, I want to say, don't you have something else to say? Can't you think of just one other thing to give me? For a long time, I would read through the Psalms, and I get to Psalm 136. I kind of looked at it the same way. Think about 12 times in, I kind of get the point. But there's a lot going on in Psalm. What Psalm 136 is actually going to do is it's not just going to tell you that God's steadfast love endures forever. It's going to show you that God's steadfast love endures forever. And it's going to do it by taking us through some of the early history of the people of Israel. Some of the good times and some of the not so good times. And showing us that God's steadfast love was there through the whole that way, no matter what you go through when you live life on this earth, you can also know that God's steadfast love is there in your life as well. For his steadfast love of you the words forever. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. If you're in Psalm 136 with me, we're just going to read the whole thing together. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who alone does great wonders, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who by understanding made the heavens for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who spread out the earth above the waters, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who made the great lights, for His steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for His steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for His steadfast love endures forever, and brought Israel out from among them, for His steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who divided the Red Sea in two, for His steadfast love endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for His steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who led His people through the wilderness, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who struck down great kings, for His steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, for His steadfast love endures forever. 
Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, a king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state, for his steadfast love endures forever. And rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. So I know that's a lot. And I know it's sort of hard to keep track of without your eyes kind of glazing over a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're sort of going to break down the psalm into smaller parts. And hopefully we'll be able to all pick out the same lessons together. But first, let's just look at verses 1 through 4 again and we'll talk about them some. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. So, what the psalm chooses to start with, before it gets into all the ways God shows his love, The psalm wants to remind you who your God is. Who is this God that we are talking about? And the first thing the psalm wants you to know is that God is good. That God is the God of justice and righteousness and love. It talks about His power, that there is no other God, no other being with the power to do miracles and to create and do wonders and works in the way that He does. Psalm 136 wants you to know that our God is a God that is amazing and powerful and so big as we sing in the kids' song sometimes. Our God is so big, and yet, He still chooses to show Himself to us in love. And we'll talk about that some more as we go. That our God though He is the only God, though He is the one with the power to do wonders and creation and miracles, yet He chooses to love us. And the psalm chooses to start all the way in verse 1 by telling us what our part is in this story. That we are to give thanks to this God. We're called upon to praise Him. To praise God for His power and His mighty works. To praise God for His steadfast love. To look at the great works around us and to choose to see our God in them. That's what Psalm 136 wants us to start with. God is good. God is perfect. God is righteous. And yet, God is loving. And the way we can repay Him for that love is by giving thanks to Him. Now let's look at the ways that Psalm 136 shows us God's love. Starting back in verse 9. To Him who by understanding made the heavens for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who spread out the earth above the waters for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who made the great lights for His steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for His steadfast love endures forever. And the moon and stars to rule over the night, for His steadfast love endures forever. So the psalmist goes all the way back to the very beginning. Our first example here of the steadfast love of God is the creation itself. The psalm brings out days 2, 3, and 4. The times where the heavens and the land itself and the sun, moon, and stars are all created by God's power. 
But I want you to think, because it's really obvious to see when we look at that, if this psalm was about the power of God, I can see why we'd be talking about creation. God is the God of gods, the only one with the power to do these great wonders and great miracles. That's obvious. But this psalm doesn't talk about the power of God over and over again. It's about His steadfast love. So we have to ask the question, how does the creation around us show us the steadfast love of God? If you want to turn to Genesis 1, I want to read a few verses there. A few verses that I think show us the love of God even in this great act of creation. Genesis 1, and I'm going to pick up in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The creation story shows us, as plainly as it could, that we are nothing. Mankind is dirt, dust. If you look out into the earth, about the least valuable thing you can possibly find is dirt. And that's what God made us out of. And yet, God blessed us. God gave us the entire earth to have dominion over and to subdue it. God gave us all of these beautiful, amazing blessings that we find in this world. Genesis 1 tells us that even though we are unworthy as material creatures, we are nothing special, yet... God made everything for us. Don't skip over that. I know some people are beach people. And to the beach people, think about the grandeur of when you look out from beach over to the ocean and just how big it is, how far it stretches, how just mind-blowingly amazing the depth of the ocean is. Or to the mountain people. Think of going up onto the high peak and looking out over all. And just how far you can see all the trees, the animals, everything. Whatever it is that you find comforting in this earth. From the big huge things like the ocean and the mountains all the way to individual leaves and blades of grass. God made it all for us so that we could see Him and we could know His blessings and we could see His love. Genesis 1 and Psalm 136 remind us that the very creation around us only exists because of God's steadfast love. That even though He has the power to do whatever He wants for Himself, He chose to make everything for us instead. 
So yes, He is the only God, a God with unimaginable power to give and to create. And we should praise Him and trust Him because even though all, He has all the power and we're just dust, He chose to bless us in such incredible ways. The creation of the world confirms that God's steadfast love endures forever. Back in Psalm 136, I'm going to pick up in verse 10. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt for his steadfast love endures forever and brought Israel out from among them for his steadfast love endures forever with a strong hand and an outstretched arm for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two for his steadfast love endures forever and made Israel pass through the midst of it for his steadfast love endures forever but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. So the second example of God's steadfast love that Psalm 136 wants us to think about is the ten plagues, is, is God freeing his people from slavery through the Exodus. And I think that makes sense. I think if I sort of put a poll out throughout the whole group of us here and I ask what is the primary example of God's deliverance and saving love in the Old Testament, a lot of us would come up with the Exodus. That's sort of what we would expect. The psalmist calls to mind the ten plagues that God sent down to Egypt to free his people. God parting the Red Sea to ensure their escape from the Egyptian army. These are clear acts of God's love for His people. But I want you to think about the situation Israel was in before the Exodus. They were slaves, and not just slaves to anyone, but slaves to perhaps the most powerful nation on earth at the time in the Egyptians. They were not even really a nation. They were just kind of a really big family. And they had absolutely no end in sight. They were being oppressed. They were being abused. They were being mistreated. From human perspective, it is the worst of the worst. It's just about, about as bad as it, as it can possibly get. And yet this is when God chooses to show his steadfast love. If you want to turn with me, I'm going to look at Exodus 2. Exodus 2, starting in verse 23, and it says it this way. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. And their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning. God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel. And God knew. I think that those are some of the most incredible verses in the entire Old Testament. That when God's people were by man's standards hopeless, when God's people had absolutely no way out, when God's people needed Him most, they humbled themselves and cried out to Him, and God saw, God heard, and God knew. It kind of gives you chills just to think about what that means when God knows. And the book of Exodus shows the rest of what happens when God knows, and that is God acts. And that's why Psalm 136 draws our attention to these verses, because it wants us to remember that even when things are at their worst by man's standards, just like they were for the Israelites. God is faithful to His people. God is faithful to His covenant. God remembers His promises. And God's steadfast love is there. 
We'll talk about this some right at the end of the lesson. But I think if you were one of the, Egypt, uh, the Israelite brickmakers, or if you were one of the Israelite midwives or one of the Israelite mothers, I don't think the time before the Exodus is exactly one where you would say, I feel God's steadfast love all around me. I can see it. God's steadfast love is active in my life now. And yet, it was. Because that was when God was hearing the groaning of His people and God was preparing to act. And Psalm 136 shows us that even though the Israelites were being oppressed and mistreated and every other bad thing, God's steadfast love was there and it was active and He was already pulling the strings to save and deliver His people. Because that's who God is. Psalm 136 points to the Exodus to show that no matter what happens in this life, and there are going to be some bad trials in this life, God's steadfast love is active in your life when you call on Him. Let's look then, starting back in Psalm 136. If you want to look with me, we'll start in verse 16 to the last example of God's love in Psalm 136. To him who led his people through the wilderness for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings for his steadfast love endures forever and killed mighty kings for his steadfast love endures forever. Sion, the king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever and gave their land as a heritage for his steadfast love endures forever, a heritage to Israel, his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. So here the psalmist, for the final example, brings us to the time of the wilderness and the conquest. That should be weird to you. That should stick out in your head. That doesn't fit the pattern. That's not like the creation. That's not like the exodus. These high points in Israel's history. If you had to think about the wilderness, is that a good time for Israel? A bad time for Israel? No, it's it's a pretty bad time. The wilderness, the time where they were only out in the wilderness to begin with because they were being punished by God. Because they didn't trust Him, they grumbled against Him, they didn't have faith, and so God sent them out into the wilderness so they could learn their lesson. Or even if you think about the conquest, because Psalm 136 draws attention to some of the highs of the conquest, these battles that they win as they come into the land, but overall the conquest is a failure. They don't listen to God. They don't drive out the people they're supposed to, and so they don't inherit the promised land fully like they were promised. Because they didn't fulfill their end of the deal. And we should be familiar with these ideas because that's a lot of the Bible. God says, I have this great, amazing thing for you if you just trust me. His people don't trust Him, and so they don't get all of the blessings that God promised. That's pretty standard for the cycle of the entire Bible. And yet... This is what Psalm 136 chooses to point to, to emphasize God's love. It says that God was leading the people out of the wilderness. That despite the fact that God was the one that put them there in the first place because they disobeyed Him, He didn't leave them there. He had every right to. He could have left them in the wilderness. They broke all the rules, yet He led them out like a father leading a child. Or the fact that God was the one that defeated all of these nations that they did defeat, not by the people of Israel being so strong and mighty, but the fact that God delivered them by His hand. And it points out again the promises to Israel and to the family of Israel, sort of going all the way back to the the idea of the land promise of Abraham, that the reason that God is faithful to His people is because God is faithful to His promises, because that's who God is. 
Psalm 136 shows there's a lot of blessings even in these terrible times. But I want you to ask why. I think I remember even all the way back thinking to my times in like the Bible lab, right? And we would spend so long going through the first few books of the Old Testament. And over and over again, Jesus was the same story. God was good, the people were bad, and God forgave them. God was good, the people were bad, God forgave them. Over and over and over again, really throughout most of the Old Testament. And it just almost got frustrating. I wanted to be like, why didn't these people listen? Why did God forgive them over and over and over again? Why did God put up with all of this? All of this distrust and foolishness and sin and idolatry and all of the bad things. Why did God put up with it all? And God answers the question for us in Exodus 34. You want to turn there. Exodus 34 is where I think the foundation of Psalm 136 comes from. If you remember where we are in the book of Exodus as we get to Exodus 34, it is not a good time for the people of Israel again. God had just gave them the Ten Commandments, this wonderful time that should be a celebration of the covenant with Him. And yet, as He's actively giving them the law, they're breaking the first two commandments. The first two commandments, you shall have no other God before Me. You shouldn't have any idols. They're down at the bottom of the mountain making a golden calf. There goes strike one and two already, right off the bat. And God's angry. God's really really angry. And yet, by the end of Exodus 34, he will have renewed the covenant with Israel. And if your question is why, why did God put up with that? God actually, right before he renews the covenant, he reminds Israel who they're renewing the covenant with. God tells us who he is. And that's found in Exodus 34, starting in verse The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed to him the name of the Lord. So this is God telling you who he is. Starting in verse 6. The Lord proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. So right before God renews this covenant with his people, God says, I want you to know who I am. I'm the Lord. And yes, I'm a God who punishes those who are obstinate in sin and are prideful. I will do that. Make no mistake about it. But who I am is also a God who forgives thousands. And I don't forgive thousands because they deserve it or because they're so amazing. I forgive thousands because I am abounding in steadfast love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. God says, do you want to know why I forgive you people so often? It's because I am love. And I think that's exactly what Psalm 136 is drawing on. The idea that even though we are sometimes an unfaithful people, there are some times where I have committed the same sin, no telling how many times, and I just want to ask, God, why do you keep forgiving me? Why have you let me get away for this long? And God says, when my people humble themselves before me, even though they're unfaithful, I am a God who forgives because I am faithful. God says, that's who I am. I am love. I am forgiveness. I am mercy. And you can't be bad enough to run away from my love. If you're willing to come back, I'll have you back. That there is no amount of sin 
that can be bigger than the amount of God's love that there is. And that's what Psalm 136 points us to in this section. During the wilderness and the conquest, the people were bad. Uh, There's just no other way to put it. They didn't trust God. They were evil. They were idolatrous. They didn't have any faith. Yet God forgave them and God blessed them. Not because they deserved it, but because that's who God is. His steadfast love endures forever. And Psalm 136 sort of reaches out its hand and says, what makes you think you're any different? That you can be unfaithful, you can mess up, and yet when you choose to ask for forgiveness, God will have you back because that's who God is. And his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pick up the last few verses and then finish the lesson up together. One, Psalm 136 verses 23 through 26. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state for his steadfast love endures forever. He who rescued us from our foes for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. So the the psalm starts really exactly where it started. Here's who your God is. Give thanks to him. Your God is the God who forgives. Your God is the God who loves. Your God is the God that has the power to do anything he wants for himself and yet chooses to bless you even though you're nothing and even though you're unworthy. God blesses you anyway. God forgives you anyway because that's who he is. For his steadfast love endures forever. So that's the psalm. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Like I said earlier, Psalm 136 is pretty repetitive. You've probably heard for his steadfast love endures forever like 58 times by now, but I think it warrants saying again because we need to hear it. When I looked at Psalm 136, I said, don't you have anything else to tell me? Why are you so repetitive? And it's because God knows I need to hear this 26 times more, really. That I need to sit and think about the power of God's steadfast love. God's loving kindness, God's eternal mercy and grace. That's what I need to sit and think about more. And Psalm 136 really reaches out to us and shows us there is not a situation in your life where God's steadfast love is not at work. Whatever is happening, sort of outside pressures, it's not going to be worse than what the people of Israel faced in the Exodus, and yet God's steadfast love was there. Whatever you're dealing with with sin and struggles there, whatever it is, it's not going to be worse than what the people of Israel dealt with in the wilderness, and yet God's steadfast love was there kind of the same thing. I think you guys talked about Jonah fairly recently. You cannot outrun God's steadfast love. It's there. The question is, will you give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love? And that's really the main question of Psalm 136. Because let me tell you, like I said earlier, I think if you're one of the Israelites that are living in the wilderness and you know you're not going to make it to the promised land, it's really hard to feel God's steadfast love then. Or if you're one of the slaves in Egypt, I bet it was really hard to feel God's steadfast love then. Or when you know people who are sick and dying, it's really hard to feel God's steadfast love then. And yet... Psalm 136 says it's there. Not because we deserve it, but because that's who God is. That God is the God who forgives thousands. Because God is the God that when you come to Him and you humbly pray to Him, He sees you, He remembers His covenant, and He knows what to do. That's who our God is. And so that's the point of Psalm 136. 
God's steadfast love endures her. The question is, will we do our part and give thanks to him? There's a lot of ways to do that. Part of it's what we're doing today. We're all getting together and we're singing praise to him. But part of that is living a thankful life. Do you honor God with the way you live? Do you reflect his steadfast love to others? Do you accept his steadfast love to forgive? Do you humbly come to him like the people of Israel did in Exodus 2? And if we do, then that's great. Keep doing it. But if we're at a point in our lives where God's steadfast love is there and he's reaching out to us and for whatever reason we're not taking him up on it, We need to really think about our path. I always throw out the invitation first to those that have no relationship with God at all. You've never repented of your sins. You've never been baptized. Come join the life of love that God wants you to live. Like I said earlier, you can't be too bad for God. If you're willing to come to Him, He can forgive whatever's in your life. And He will. He'll wipe the slate clean because that's who He is. You can join his steadfast love. You can repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. But I also like to remind us that the invitation isn't just for people who aren't Christians. The invitation is for anyone. If you are in a stage in your life where you realize that you've gotten away from living the life of love that God calls you to. The invitation can be for you too. I don't know what you need. We'd be happy to talk with you, to pray with you, to pray for you. But I want you to know that God's steadfast love is there. No matter if you can see it right now or not, it's there. It's working in your life. It's working through Jesus. It's working through the cross. The question is, will you accept that and will you give thanks to him in your life? Whatever you need, feel free to come to the front as we stand and as we sing.